So good morning to everyone. I'm Jeff Brown, and this is Saturday Morning Breakfast, a program of First Parish Church in Stowe and Acton. And Stowe TV is recording this for later broadcasts. Next month, April, Paul Reisberg, who is a member of FPC, will be talking about the increased use of electricity with EVs and induction stoves and, and heat pumps. And we'll also talk about how we might increase the uh, capacity of the electric grid for those purposes. So today we have Casey Robinson from the Silver Unicorn Bookstore and an author. But before we get, uh, begin with her, well, there's a question of the day. And today the question is, what is your favorite children's book? And this one for me, for me, it's uh, very easy. Maybe you might not have one, or if you have a grandchild, you can, you know, use that as your favorite. Um, I'll ask Casey this last, and I'll answer next to last. So let's start with Sharon. Do you have a favorite children's picture book? Whoop, you're on mute. Um, the one I had, um, I still have. Um, there was a, a Cuthbert and there was a, uh, the stone soup one and um, the uh, little red, um, it's not a picture book. It was a little red uh, fairy bells, uh, a book of fairy tales. Okay. Uh, which I would periodically read. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Every five years or so. Rick's uh, favorite one is Wind in the Willows. Okay, great. Uh, Sue Stewart? Um, without a doubt, uh, from my years of working as an elementary school librarian, Tacky the Penguin, the, the most fun read aloud ever. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Wanda? Well, I guess I'd have to go with where the wild things are. Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, Jonathan? I would probably say pretty much any Dr. Seuss book. I, okay. We went through all of them and read them quite a lot. Yeah. Uh, Craig? I would say uh, The Hungry Caterpillar, Eric Carl's Hungry Caterpillar. And I, and I say that not because I liked reading it. I say that because my son is a uh, working for Bombus, and he is collaborating with the Eric Carl group to design socks uh, in collaboration with, with the Hungry Caterpillar uh, franchise or, or um, not franchise. What do I want to say? Um, with their with their logo, with their with their uh, brand, with their yeah. brand. So yeah, yeah. that would be mine. Good. That's great. Uh, Janet, are you there? Uh, she may have stepped yes. away for Janet. Oh, Hello. Uh, Janet. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear can you. you. Okay. Sorry, I have two different. Um, uh, sorry, I had to throw my headphones on real quick. Um, oh. Yeah, I, you know, I couldn't remember, but when Jonathan said Dr. Seuss, um, I think for my own favorite, uh, oh, wait, okay, but as a mom, Mike Mulligan and his steam shovel, hmm. <laughs> we loved, my son and I loved that book so much. So, uh, yeah. Uh, for picture good. books. Yeah, good. That's great. Marsha, uh, the question of the day was, what's your favorite children's picture book? Do you have one? Um, I think I would go with um, Wanda and say the um, Where the Wild Things Are. Yeah, okay. My kids love that book. Uh -huh. and, and I have to say that all the ones that have been mentioned were all books that that I read to them before they could read. And then and then they just kept on going. Yeah, great. 
Uh, Rona, are you there? She might not be there. I know Lee has stepped away. Linda, what was your favorite? What is your favorite children's picture book? Uh, the little engine that could. Yeah. We had to make it over the mountain to get the little children's toys to them. And he just yeah. kept saying, I think I can. I think I can. I think I, I don't know. Yeah. I just love that. Yeah. So actually, uh, geographically speaking, Linda and I are in West Bloomfield, Michigan for Linda's sister's uh, birthday party. And Craig is in Washington, D.C. for a wedding. So that's the beauty of Zoom. Yeah, it can be anywhere. Yes, that's right. So now, uh, oh yeah, I got to answer the question myself. And um, I was born in 1951. And in 1957, Dr. Seuss came out with his first book, uh, The Cat in the Hat. And I, mm -hmm. I used to get just the old, uh, I was the youngest of three. Uh, I think they were Disney books, but they were, you know, little square, almost square. Golden books. books. Pardon me? The little golden books. Little, yeah, the little golden books. And then the cat in the hat was, you know, twice as big and very vibrant colors and so forth. So that was my favorite. Okay, great. So thanks for the answers. And now we'll go to Casey. And so Casey, it's your favorite picture book, but not one that you wrote. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just wouldn't say that anyway, Jeff. Oh, okay. I wouldn't, um, even though I love my books. Um, I, as a kid, I loved uh, Frog and Toad, those that mm -hmm. that series. Mm -hmm. um, as an adult, and certainly as a writer, actually, I have a copy of it right here. Um, my favorite picture book is this one. Owl Moon, beautiful. Owl Moon by Jane, Jane Yolen. She's a mentor of mine, and every time I read this book. It takes my breath away. Mm -hmm. um, and a, a secret story you may not know about this book is that Jane wrote this about her daughter, Heidi Stemple, who's also a children's book author. Um, so the little girl in this used to go owling with Jane's um, husband. So she wrote, it took her a very, very long time to write this to get it quite right. But mm -hmm. when she did, it's spectacular, so I highly recommend it. There's some just lines that, you, it's one of those atmospheric books that you you feel like the kid in the story when you're reading it. The whole experience of the quiet and the cold and the anticipation of going owling at night with your, with your pa, it's amazing. That one's my favorite. Good. <clears throat> okay, well you can go right, well actually we'll take a moment to ask Lee because he wasn't here, what was your favorite or is your favorite children's picture book? Uh, from being a kid, it was uh, uh, early Seuss uh, to think that I saw it on Mulberry Street and uh, on Beyond Zebra and uh, all of the imaginative stuff that I think those are, are um, most books have uh, exposed uh, some problematic things these days. You can't find them, but I really loved them at the time. Yeah, good. Okay, back to Casey. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming. Thanks for joining me today. Um, thank you for asking me to be here. I um, I my kids will tell you I I never tire of talking about kids' books. <laughs> and the process and the wonder of it. And I love, love, love um, the creative processes. I'm happy to share with you a little bit about behind the scenes um, information, I guess, um, a little peek behind the scenes of the creation of um, my first book, which came out in 2018. And it's called Ivor and Ellsworth. And it's illustrated by Melissa Larson. She's amazing. Um, and actually you can see the <laughs> giant, giant po picture I have on my wall. Um, so I thought I would just share a couple of slides. Let me see. I can get this. Okay. You see this? Yep. Yep. That's good. Awesome. 
Okay. <clears throat> my favorite, uh, my favorite part about writing books for kids is if you're going to do it and you're going to do it well, you have to capture some of the things that I think I just heard everybody uh, talk about when they were re referencing their favorite children's picture books as kids. There is an element of imagination. There's an element of wonder, um, a, a sort of true and natural sense of awe in the way that kids experience and look at the world. And so in order to write stories for kids that kids are gonna wanna actually read, and you all know, picture books in particular, if they're good, they get pulled from the shelf over and over and over and practically ask and demand parents to, um, to memorize the words, right? So picture book stories that, um, that are able to tap into that, that sense of imagination. Um, that's sort of my goal when I'm thinking about the place I wanna be when I'm writing a, a good story. So all that is to say, um, the creative process behind <coughs> Ivor and Ellsworth, this book, <coughs> happened on a very, um, started on a very ordinary day. So this is, I love this quote by the infamous Albus Dumbledore in Harry Potter. Words are, in my not so humble opinion, our most inexhaustible source of magic. And I would argue in picture books, that is certainly true, but we also have the, the magic of the illustration process. And I'm gonna share a little bit about that with you too, because what happens when you have both it's almost like alchemy. So you start with the story and you, you apply the ingredients of illustration and what you get back is something that is much bigger and better than the parts, the individual parts. So I'll show you that in a little bit. So uh, magic can happen, ideas can happen anywhere if you are open to them. So the idea for Ivor and Ellsworth happened as I was driving down uh, the road. Ideas can happen on an arguably otherwise very boring rooftop, for example. I don't know if anybody knows what this is. Probably not. It's an aerial view, but I'm sure you know what this is. Mm. The Polar Factory on 290 in Worcester. I have driven past this a thousand times but for some reason on this day i looked at the bear and i i thought to myself who takes care of that bear <laughs> does that bear have any friends what happens when the weather turns um so i i started jotting down in my i was not driving jotting down in my notes app um an idea for a story about a friendship with a giant inflatable bear. And that is where this started. <laughs> this is the very glamorous place that I wrote the first draft of the story. And at this point I had, um, I had a very um, almost tingly feeling about the story. I could feel the characters, um, they felt real to me. And I just wanted to, to share them. And usually when I'm writing stories, the best stories end up being the ones where I feel this sense of um, authenticity about the characters. And like, I'm trying to share versus create. There's, there's a, I don't know, it's, it feels different to me. I can write pretty sentences, but it doesn't mean they're gonna make anyone feel anything. And I think that the best picture books make you feel something. Okay. So I write a story and I revise the story and I make sure that it's good. I think it's good. And then what happens after that? At this point, I didn't have an agent yet. And so um, I belong to several picture book groups um, online. I, you know, I try to absorb everything I can about um, the publishing process and um, stay connected to other picture book writers and resources. And so I, um, I found my publisher through one of those groups. I had a good feeling um, listening to a webinar about the kinds of books that my editor loved and wanted to bring other books into the world like those books. 
he listed a lot of books that I loved personally. Um, and so I just felt like it was gonna be a good fit. I would love to know how long you think it takes. Does anybody know how long it takes? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, half an um, hour or so yeah yeah half an hour <laughs> yeah. i could probably i'll just send one off after i get off this call um the publishing process for picture, children's picture books is, is slow it's very slow so i'm going to share with you the timeline and these are sort of the highlights and then i'll show you some some details um after i give you the punchline so i wrote um and submitted my story in January of 2016. I heard back um, from my editor in March, which is actually quite fast. Sometimes you don't hear back at all because editors are very, very, very inundated with submissions. And if, especially if you're unagented, you might not hear back at all. So often they'll tell you, if you don't hear back in eight weeks or nine weeks or 12 weeks, you can assume it's a no. So I got an email. And we had a call and we talked about some revisions and I really liked the idea they had um, for how to make the story better. And I got a contract in April. So this is a very fast timeline. Sometimes it takes, you know, six months to, to sign a contract or nine months even, depending on what's happening behind the scenes at the publisher. So in May, also very fast, uh, Melissa Larson was signed as my illustrator. And that also can take a really long time. So usually they won't, uh, a publisher won't commit to uh, a publishing date until they have an illustrator signed. And after an illustrator is signed, uh, that illustrator usually gets a year to do the illustrations. It takes a really long time. They do sketches and they review with the art director and final art, some, depending on what medium they're using can take a really long time. Also illustrators book out, so they may not have time or space to work on a project for a period of time. So they might not start on your book until a year from when you've asked them. Um, it's all kind of up in the air. But when you get a great illustrator who gets, gets the feel of your text, it's worth, uh, it's worth waiting. So January, I send it out. May, I have an illustrator. Mm -hmm. July, she finishes also fast, July of 2017. So there's a whole year where I know this thing is going to appear somewhere in my future, but I don't know what it's gonna look like. But let me tell you, when I was able to see that final art, that's a feeling, that is a feeling for the first time when you get to see your book, your words, your characters coming to life. It's incredible. It's an incredible, magical feeling. So uh, we finished the files and sent them off to get printed in September of 2017. Everybody talks that I'm an indie bookstore uh, fanatic, but there's a moment when someone texts you and tells you that your book is on, on Amazon that feels significant. And it's a sign usually that, that pre-orders are gonna start and you can start sending people to your independent bookstore um, to place your pre-orders. That was a big, a big moment also. Um, and then, you know, you send out uh, copies, your publisher sends out copies to trade review places. And you also don't know if anyone is gonna pick it up or look at it or read it, let alone review it. Um, they don't tell you in advance. So one day you get an email, here's a review. Um, so that happened in February of 2018. So January 2016 was when I wrote that story, when I jotted down those little notes, driving down 290. And then we really started doing a lot of publicity in the spring of 2018. Um, and it came out in May of 2018. So this is a lot. My kids thought this was endless waiting, endless <laughs> waiting. I mean, for them, you know, they're in elementary school so at this time. So it was a long time. Um, so this is the email that I got telling me that they were interested in the story. Casey Robinson, hi. I, this was like, ooh, I thought, you know, uh, I don't know if they're going to want to ask me for something called a revise and resubmit, which is 
we're interested, but we need to make, we need you to make it better. That happens um, quite often. Um, but when we talked on the phone, he said he wanted a contract. So I knew I was going to get a contract when he got off the, that first phone call. So a few, um, two months later, I got this, this email unannounced and this sketch. <laughs> and this is the first time I saw my story come to life. Mm. And my reaction was, of course, of course they look like this. Look at Ivor, look at his little cap and his mustache and his glasses and his little apple for lunch. This is exactly how the story felt to me. And I don't write with a, with a, I, I'm a visual imagination person, but I don't, I write by feel and not by um, a very specific um, image. And I find that that's very helpful because you have no control whatsoever about, about this process. In fact, you usually, typically the author does not have any contact with the illustrator. The editor and the art director have all of the conversations. So I have conversations about general feel. I knew that I didn't want um, a glossy, cartoony style of illustration. It just wouldn't have worked with my text. I needed something um, more sort of gentle and quieter to go with the feel of the text and the feel of the story. And so this part where, you know, my, my, my imagination channeled into words, shipped off to the ether, someone else absorbs and comes back to me with the visuals for that story that I plucked out of thin air is totally magical and amazing. And I still can't believe this is what happens. But when you have the right team as part of this process, um, this is what happens, it's amazing. So after this, she, um, she went and did sketches. Oh yeah, this is the announcement. So this is another big moment when something gets announced in Publishers Weekly and then everybody can know about it and talk about it and ask you about it. Um, so that was the, the announcement. And then Melissa started working on um, sketches. So if you can see behind me, this is one of the panels inside, um, inside spreads, but it also ended up being the cover image. And she did all of this in watercolor. She's amazing. Mm -hmm. This is another one of the sketches. And so she was playing with um, some of the text placement also. Usually that happens after it's digitally, but you kind of need to know where you're going to leave space for the text. So that is the final image. And I didn't see these sketches until after, actually. So in here you can kind of see, so she's on the right, she's working with tracing paper so she can move and position the characters um, in different places without having oh. to do every time. And the text below is also a separate piece. You can kind of see that. <laughs> and this image actually, uh, originally, my editor was thinking about using this as the cover image because it was so beautiful. But this, and Wanda, you can speak to this as a librarian, but this is much more inviting. Right? Mm -hmm. They're facing you, they're, they're inviting you to, to come into the book. But, but we loved this, this image so much that on the underside of the book, it's printed under <laughs> as the, mm. so you can see the whole spread. Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. uh... Always check underneath the dust covers, if you can, <laughs> if the library allows you. I love this quote. 
it's not personal experience that helps you understand other people's lives. It's having a sympathetic imagination. And this is, this is why I think picture books in particular are so important to kids because they can deliver stories in a way that makes you feel something. And this is how we build empathy. And this is it, you know, the picture book in particular, the format, think about it. It's kids usually read them in the context of surrounded by love and care. So on a lap of a parent or a grandparent or a family member or um, in on a rug with teachers who care about them and other kids who care about them. And so it provides this um, place of safety, I think, to experience uh, story. What's that for? Oh, put it right. Okay, that's all I have. Oh, that, well, that was terrific. Um, yeah. I, we've got several questions, but I'll ask one to start <laughs> it off. So I noticed that, uh, what was the original name of the character was Ollie and it got changed to Elsa. Yeah. How did that or happen? Yeah, the original name was Orson and that's because that's the bears, the actual bear, the polar bear's oh. name is Orson, which I didn't know, but I looked it up. So I used that as a placeholder when I was writing the original draft of the story. And then we decided to change it. You know, I didn't wanna get in trouble with polar. Um, so we went back and forth and back and forth. Um, I liked Orson because it was o, there was an O and it felt round, like he felt round to me. Um, but we decided on Ellsworth in part because I grew up in Maine and that was that's a town on my way to Bar Harbor that I loved. So <laughs> <laughs> all these uh, little decisions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Janet, you had some questions? Yes, uh, I just I just was wondering how was it live on Amazon before it was published. Everything is live on Amazon before it's published, and actually, um, the uh, Amazon started shipping it. So some people ordered pre ordered through Amazon, and some people started ship. Uh, Amazon started shipping it about six weeks before the pub date. So unbeknownst to me one day I started to get text messages with from friends who had pre-ordered uh with pictures of their kids reading the book oh. and and you know before my launch events were scheduled and before um I couldn't sleep it was so <laughs> amazing like seeing I mean that was another one of those significant moments is seeing the faces in particular of the kids wrapped up in your story I mean, oh, that's great. Yeah, it's amazing. Do you have anything else, Janet? Um, no, I am curious about those Facebook groups because I wrote a children's book when I was uh, like, I don't want to date myself, but decades ago. And I kind of still, this one that I think wasn't too bad. I only sent it out like once or twice. And I kind of wondered about those Facebook groups. I might like, could I like just send them the manuscript and see, say like, is this worth sending out? Um, I will put in the chat. So there's a couple of groups. Um, Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators. That is sort of the national organization that most children's writers I know belong to. They have a ton of good resources to answer that very question. Um, okay. There's also, uh, I don't know what the, you can Google this. Um, there's a group for picture book writers called 12 by 12. Um, oh. And it's run by Julie Hedlund. I'm gonna put that in the channel. So I don't know what the URL is off the top of my head, but you can Google that. Yeah, so like they're a group. That's the group um, that I belonged to where I found this particular publisher. Um, so it's membership. I think you can, they had, they have a membership, um, like a registration at the beginning of every year, but it's wonderful. It, when I found out about 12 by 12, it was a little bit like, you know, I was teaching myself how to write picture books there. Um, does anybody know how many words are in picture books? Wanda, you are not allowed to answer this. 
<laughs> oh no, anyhow. Uh, 500. 500. Oh. Hmm. 500. Typically, so you'll notice the the books from a, from years ago are longer generally, mm -hmm. but huh. but right now, right now it's about five hundred words. So if you think about it, you know five hundred words is not a lot of words. Mm -hmm. It's no. not a lot of real estate to create characters that you care about, and and at, you know situations that keep you wanting to turn the page. I mean, you have to do yes. so much with so little, and that's part of the reason I love picture books as a format because it's such a challenge. And all my friends who are novelists, they say, oh, you're crazy. I could never write a picture book. And I think 60,000 words for a middle grade novel is nuts. And that would take me years to, to do because I'm, I'm so used to the, you know, the compression of picture book format. Um, but when I found out about 12 by 12, Janet, it was like opening the door and finding the party with all the other picture book writers. Um, so it does matter. It's it's nice to have a community of people who understand the format in particular. Yeah. 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 So uh, Casey, there's a couple of questions from Craig yeah. in the chat. Craig, okay, I'm going to go from the yeah. bottom up. Melissa, yeah, I, well, I, I can ask him or, well, whatever. Yeah. So she, uh, Melissa was living in Idaho and then she moved to Alaska. She's never been to Worcester or has never seen the polar bear. And actually we didn't really want it to look a lot like that, that polar bear anyway. We wanted Ellsworth to be his own uh, character, his own, to stand on his own. Um, so she, she didn't, she didn't, she didn't use it. You know, the story itself feels like um, not a huge city, but it has some city. So um, she just made it up. She made it up. Was her was her first illustration of the bear similar to what you had envisioned it was going to be? Uh, obviously, you didn't want it to be look like look exactly like the polar bear on top of the building, but there's a lot of vision, lot of lot of uh, yeah. variety in polar bears. Yes, yeah, it did because he's so welcoming. I mean, look at that little face. He has sweet a little smile. Smile in all, so you don't. <laughs> You know, he doesn't speak in the story. He never speaks. So he's not, um, he's not anthropomorphized at all, but you sort of never really know if he's real or not real, if he has feelings or you sort of feel like he might. So there's, he's intriguing, but he's so friendly. And so, yes, I would say that, that she, she managed to capture that. I don't know how, I mean, the illustrators are just amazing to me. Um, uh, all of the choices that she made around him. I think she, she nailed it. Uh, uh, a question, D did you ever hear from the Polar Company about? You know what? I did a school visit um, in Worcester at a private school and uh, they are, uh, the family is very involved with the school. And so they, so when I, when I arrived, they had sent um, all this polar stuff for the school visit. So all the kids <laughs> had seltzers and they had a little sign and it was really nice. Um, yeah, so they did, they did. So there's a couple more questions from Craig in the chat. Um, advances, yeah, so this, it varies widely. Um, all book hunt, you know, it depends on the publishers. It depends on the size of the publishers. So typically you do get advances, um, but you know, it's a cash flow thing. So smaller publishers might trade an advance um, to not give you an advance, but they give you higher royalty rates. And then when you, um, typically you would get an advance against royalties. And then once you have earned out that advance, you will start getting royalty checks after your advance. So um, it depends, it all depends. Uh, Craig, you have tons of good questions here. Mm. How did you- my wife, my wife writes college textbooks, so I'm, I'm familiar with it, but this is a totally different animal. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's totally different. Um, pick an editor. Yeah, so this is, so my style, um, of sort of approaching all of, even writing drafts. I'm very, um, I'm not like a super prolific 
uh, Jack Kerouac, Stephen King, lots of words kind of writer. And it's the same um, way with figuring out who to send it to. So I was pretty meticulous about doing research to, um, you know, going to the library and seeing, I started to notice kind of like real estate, you know, you start to notice once you start paying attention to listings, you start to notice what's, what a feel for a town might be. So it's the same thing with books. So I started to notice who's publishing the books I love and the same names kept coming up. And then I can sort of do a little digging. Thank you, internet, uh, for who the editors were for those books and who are the agents representing those writers and illustrators that I love. And you just, you just start to get a sense of who's doing what kind of book. And it is worth figuring that out in advance because I can tell you that editors really appreciate the thoughtfulness and the time that you've taken to figure out where your book fits, both in terms of what other books are out there, they call those comps, you know, you do, you do need to know where your book is going, going to sit on the library shelves, um, what it's going to be competing with, that kind of thing. Um, so this editor, I just, I just loved everything he had to say about the reason he started his press, the kind of books he wanted to bring out into the world, the ones he already loved were all on my list of things, books that I loved. Um, and then unbeknownst to me, actually, he, uh, his wife used to live outside of Worcester. So when they read the story, <laughs> she was like, oh, this room, it was like one of those montage moments on the movie, you know, the Pixar movies when she had this flashback to being a child and the bear on the thing, you know, it's just like a whole serendipitous thing. So you just never know, you know, I did the work in advance. I figured out where to send it. So I called, you know, the light, I guess I increased probability that way. But then you just never know. You never know what someone is gonna, gonna be carrying around in their heart that in some way that what you're doing might speak to them. Um, it's just, you know, kind of luck of the draw in that way. But um, yeah, it was ended up being a good choice. So um, let's see. Oh, Janet, uh, Wanda shared that she was a librarian. So that's why I was I was razzing her about knowing all of the all of the answers about children's books. <laughs> oh, okay, thanks. I didn't know that, Wanda. I wanted to be that. That's a great job. Yeah, it is. Um, Sharon, you're raising your hand. Did you have a question? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so I know an illustrator who's tried to get her book published. Took it to New York, shopped it around, never got it published. Do you know, what do you, what do you know about when the book process starts with the illustrator mm -hmm. with a few words, you know, there's text. Yep. Um, as opposed to the other way around, which you described. Yep. Um, so author illustrators who do both the words and the pictures typically will uh, follow a similar process. It depends on whether, you know, they're agented um, or unagented, the process is similar. Um, that said, I think, illustrators have to have a portfolio, um, an online portfolio. I think sometimes even if they do have books that they have written and illustrated, sometimes um, people, art directors will be interested in hiring them to do illustrations only for someone else's written book um, text. So um, the same, I would say the same resources, um, I would recommend the same resources to to illustrators who do write and illustrate their own books. Um, the SCBWI organization is fantastic. They have like a, um, a whole database of illustration um, illustrators who can put their, you know, their work and their websites linked to their portfolios. And a lot of, a lot of art directors will go there to, to search. Um, in fact, I think that's how Rob found Melissa Larson for my book. I think that's where he found her. Um, the thing was, she wasn't looking for illustration work. She had a completed manuscript. Concept. Yeah, it's the yeah. Same. yeah, it's the same. I mean, instead of sending a Word document, you send up um, a PDF usually with you don't even have to have the whole book fetched out because often, you know, an art director will want to work with you to to make it better in the same way that they would work with me on the editorial process. So usually they do one or two spreads of final art just to give a sense for the, you know, the, what the final product would look like. And then 
a sketch for the rest of it. Um, so they call that a dummy. So that so the you know an author illustrator would submit a dummy um, instead of a word document, but the process would be very similar. Good. Uh, any other questions for Casey? I just had a I just had a follow up question, Casey. Um, you out you run a bookstore, right? So I don't run a bookstore, but I work um, for Paul's um, at the Silver Unicorn Bookstore in West Acton. So I run events. Um, for them. And actually, Paul and I met because the Silver Unicorn Bookstore was the bookstore that launched my Ivor and Ellsworth debut. And mm -hmm. they had opened just a month or so before the book came out. So we were sort of debuting at the same time. And um, our my debut um, event was one of the first big events that they held. So it was, we've been fast friends since then. So you're holding, you're holding three jobs at this point. You're, <laughs> you're a mother, <laughs> you're a mother, you're working in a bookstore, and you're a writer. Yeah, yeah. Which one's which one's which one's the career? Which one's which one's your uh, you love? You know what? The best part about all of, of about having arranged my life in this way, to be perfectly honest, is that it's all connected. So I feel like I'm being me in all of those ways all the time. So I'm reading books with my kids, we're talking about story, I'm listening to them, the way they talk about the world or the way they laugh about something, or it, it's all, you know, I'm helping with events, promote people, I, you know, an industry I care about. Um, book people are the best people. And you know, <laughs> that includes readers and uh, wanderers and librarians and teachers and educators and just, and kids, you know, it's all connected. So I don't feel like I'm, it's disparate. I don't feel like it's compartmentalized at all. I think it's just the way I'm living my life at the moment. It's all joyful. It's fun. <laughs> Writing stories is fun. Reading stories to kids is really fun. Is there another book in the works that we're, we can look forward to? Yeah. So again, now that you know, it takes a long time for these things to come out. I do have a book coming out in the spring of 2024 um, with Penguin, but it hasn't been announced yet. Um, it hasn't been announced yet, so I can't talk about it yet, <laughs> but, but I'm very excited about it. And it's a manuscript that I wrote um, at the very beginning of the pandemic. And I had a very similar feeling about the characters that I did about Ivor Nelsworth. It just felt like they were sitting next to me on the couch and I wanted, and I still feel that actually, I just reread it. I haven't looked at it in a while, but um, I feel, I, I'm very excited about it. I think it's a, it's a, it's a feeling story about community and about um, an accidental repair shop and what happens when you fix small But things. you change publishers. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. In part, because I, I now have an agent and he has um, a lot of relationships with editors in different houses. Um, so we just, it's its a little bit of a fit question always with manuscripts, you know, where is the best fit and who is the best type of editor for this? And so we found, um, we found a different house. So it's great. I'm excited. Yes, Sharon, you have a question. Um, yeah, do you read your uh, initial stories to your kids before you get that published? I do. They are my my biggest critics, I would say, but most helpful, most helpful. So usually when I'm done, when I think I'm done with it and I've workshopped it with my critique group and um, and I feel like it's ready, I will have them read it to me aloud so I can hear, you know, picture books are musical. A, a lot of them are musical. And I, so you can feel the rhythms and the cadence and if there are word choices that make them stumble, even though I was able to read it a certain way, they don't read it that way, that matters. Um, if there are threads that they don't understand or something that feels clunky, I, I can hear it when they're reading it to me, but also um, they, will, they will point it out. I don't understand this, this phrase. What does this mean or what's happening here? I have to pay attention to that. So they are like my final polish. Um, and it's really fun to have, um, I don't know, to be able to include them in the trying process. You know, they get to see the working and the reworking and the uh, making it better and they're part of it. You know, it's not something that I'm delivering to them. It's something that 
they have been part of. So they get to feel the same sense of pride and excitement that I do when, when they get to hold the books in their hands. So I love that too. It feels very inclusive. Very How nice. old are your kids? Uh, well, now they are 14, 12 and a half and almost 10. So would you transition as your kids grow older to young adult? Well, I'm trying to write a middle grade, even though I said I would never write a 60,000 yeah. word story. I'm, I'm trying to write a middle grade novel right now in verse, actually. So it's not quite, it feels more similar to picture book format in that the, they're poems um, instead of prose. But um, I'm mostly doing it because I, I don't know what I don't know. And so I say to you that I'm intimidated about writing a middle grade novel, but I don't actually know that that's true until I've tried it. So I'm trying it to see what happens. And I'm learning a lot about what kind of a writer I am and who knows. I mean, we may look back on this recording and say, you know, oh, that's the book she, she wrote, she told us about. But, um, but the process of trying something new and expanding, you know, and pushing your comfort zone is always a good idea, I think, from a learning perspective. So yeah, that's great. We'll see. Yes, but picture books are my love, my first love. I love them. Any other final questions for Casey? Uh, Ru uh, Runa, I just wanted to tell you that I know you missed some of the presentation, but it's being recorded. And once it's released by Stowe TV, I'll send you the link so you can watch the whole thing at your leisure. Good, thank you. Sure. Uh, Casey, thank you very much. That was a terrific presentation. We can feel your enthusiasm. <laughs> right. We have... Um, Lots of authors coming to the Silver Unicorn Bookstore too. And some of those are virtual still. We're still doing some, some amount of virtual. So I encourage everybody to check out um, their website. I have a picture book, a couple of picture book authors coming today actually at 11 uh, virtual to, to share their stories. Um, it's always a nice way to feel connected, I think to um, the process and to the people behind the books. I don't know, I find that endlessly fascinating too. Everybody's process is different. Everybody's, you know, origin story for the idea is different. And um, I think it's really inspiring to be able to talk to. Great, um, good. Thanks very much. You're welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Okay, bye-bye. Good luck. Bye. Thank you.